Welcome back to Cult Pop. I'm your host, Jim Hall, and we've got one of my favorite guests on the show today. Uh, this is his third time on the show, so that's a record. We absolutely love having him, and it's Marcus Seiki, New York Times bestselling author. He's come out with another new book, The Amateurs, and this is his best so far. We've had him on for three of his novels, and every time I say it's your best so far, and it really is. Marcus, congratulations on another great novel, and thank you so much for coming on the show thank today. Thank you. Thanks for having me, Jim. I always love coming on. Well, let's uh, jump right in. Uh, the folks at home are going to want to know about this new one, The Amateurs. It's another one of your thrillers, everyday man type of story where everyday people find themselves in a situation, and when you're reading it, you really find yourself asking yourself the question, would I do this? What would I do in this situation? Good. Just to give the start of this novel a little bit of a start, we've got four good friends that are kind of in a, a Thursday evening get-together drinking club, that they've become best friends that as you move on in life, they've become friends where maybe their best friends from the past aren't their best friends now. It's the people they find themselves hanging with now mm -hmm. that become the best friends. They're in this club, they're drinking, a uh, bartender has got an obnoxious, jerky boss, and they find a situation that comes to them that they may be able to make a little money from this situation. So as we talk a lot when we do this, I don't want to give too much away. You, you tell uh, the folks at home what you want to say about the amateurs, and, and I think I gave it a good start. As yeah, you definitely, that, you, you definitely got at the heart of it. Yeah. Uh, what I wanted to do with this one is that it's for anybody who's ever walked out of a crime movie thinking, if I had to, I could probably rob a bank, mm -hmm. you know, or, or just considered the one-time criminal action to, to set everything right in your life. And I think everybody has. You might not admit to it, but I think you've at least considered sure, that you might do sure. it. Sure, sure. And these guys, they're four ordinary people. They're in their 30s. They're not where they thought they'd be at this. It's not that there's anything explicitly wrong with their lives. They're just not, it's just not turning out quite the way that they thought. And they see this opportunity to, uh, to take a very risky move, mm -hmm. but they think if they do it, it might make right everything in their lives. And I think a lot of us, uh, you made the point when you go to a movie theater, I, I'm smart enough to know that. And I, yeah, I'd overthink this stuff. And there were some great little things you wrote about that just little things I haven't even thought about. And the police are always one step ahead of you. And I guess I should have read enough books and, and yours was real good. But something I had never thought about was one of the characters who was kind of a little, I don't know if he was bookish, but he was kind of the quiet guy and, and the last to really get get in on, on this whole idea mm -hmm. but he came up with the whole thing and I love the the really uh, details you put into all your novels and this is one that I absolutely loved the shoes and that he recommended that they had to get different size shoes than their feet so if the uh, police really came and tracked them down now did you come up with this through your research or did you just think about this because you're so <laughs> devious and you've been thinking about it but I, I've really wanted to know since I read that I, I like that might be the next <laughs> the next cover jacket for me you're so devious Marcus. <laughs> Uh, mostly I, most of these details come from, from riding with cops and from reading okay. these novels, but also just from thinking about it myself. I mean, that was what I wanted to do was these, these four decide to undertake a robbery that the victim is a guy you don't mind victimizing mm -hmm. and they don't see how it's going to go wrong. But there is, they wanted them to be as smart as possible about it. I didn't want readers to be reading it thinking, this is this right. is Sure, they're going to get caught. They're idiots, sure. And so I was really trying to think if I was in this position, how I would do it. And then the thing is, of course, we'd all, we all imagine we could rob a bank, but we're all terribly suited as criminals oh, sure. when it actually comes down to it. And so there are all kinds of things that they forget. And, of course, all kinds of things they don't know about the people they're robbing. And you don't really suspect, I, I think, that a true criminal has at some point had to make those tough decisions about if they need to pull a gun, if violence is needed and things like that, they're able to do that. And for non-criminals, I think that's the aspect of the criminal mind or the criminal nature that's tough. Okay, sure, I think I'm smart enough to pull this off, but if something goes wrong, am I able to then deal with uh, that? Yeah, I mean, am I ruthless enough? Most real, m most real life crime is people who are not thinking it out in advance and who are acting out of anger. A lot of them are stoned, mm -hmm. and that gun comes up fast mm -hmm. there. And that's, I think, something where normal people would hesitate. Right. Now, uh, something I've noticed about a, f a few of your novels, and this one in particular, is that it deals with an age group that I've just left, you know, now that I'm in my 40s, and, uh, but a group that the four people really had pretty good lives. Mm -hmm. And they, they really, you know, maybe they weren't where they thought they should be, but to really, they didn't really need to do this. But they thought, oh, we could, and everybody could use. It was about two hundred and fifty thousand dollars, a good mm -hmm. amount of money that split up four ways would make a nice, nice haul for people. And I kind of find it funny. 
do you think it's more, you wrote these characters, is it more really when it boiled down that they just wanted adventure? That the adventure was more the, the lure than the money? It's absolutely part of it. Uh, and for different characters, different things. Some mm -hmm. of them had reasons where they really did desperately need this money and it would mm -hmm. solve problems. Right. But for the others, yeah, I think it was, I think we're all kind of raised on fairy tales of adventure. I mean, I'm 35, I'm finally getting it through my head, I'm not going to be Han Solo. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, that's kind of a tough revelation sometimes and I, I think these guys especially they weren't happy where they were in their lives and so this sense of adventure this idea of just being able to change everything in one stroke was really uh, intoxicating to them now i absolutely loved it and like i say we're, we're always a, it's tricky as to how much to say without ruining it for people so we, we don't want to give away too much but one difference i want to point out to um Com compared to some of your past books, like Good People. In Good People, a, a decision was real easy. That was real easy. Bag of money, boom, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who wouldn't? You'd, in my mind, when I read that, I was thinking, you'd be, like, literally, I, I love the books. I talk back to your books when I read them, <laughs> and I'll say, well, who would, you know, I'll literally, who wouldn't do this? Come on, of course. In this one, in, in The Amateurs, although I, I could see it throwing around, it would be a tough decision, but tough in the way that in a past book, it didn't seem like there'd be any possible repercussions. With this one, it seemed easier to get away with, in my mind, in this one, but a heck of a lot more possible repercussions, mm -hmm. and the repercussions come. And there's some real good twists in this one. So do we, we, we don't want to say anything else more, or do you want to say anything well, else? Well, I, I don't want to give away the twist, because I no, think yeah, that no, there, saying, there yeah. definitely are some surprises there's in a few this different one. twists, uh, yeah. But to that point, yeah, definitely, I wanted to write, this isn't, um, with each book I've tried to do something different, and this isn't just a reimagining of, of good people. I wanted in this one to really explore people at that stage in their life, and especially at this time in life where everything is upside down and the people who, are, who have lived their lives the way you're supposed to and saved for a rainy day and worked hard all their lives, they're watching their savings accounts disappear. Mm -hmm. And the CEOs who are crooked and run Ponzi schemes sure. are p taking golden parachutes out to the Bahamas. And it, it just, it, that bothers me, and I wanted to play with that in my characters, that they're looking at that and they're saying, well, screw this. I mean, screw doing it the right way. Apparently, breaking right. the rules is how you get ahead. Well, I, I absolutely love the book, and, and I've told you this last time, you're, you are now one of my must-reads when, when your books come out. Now, obviously, I can't tell you stuff, but I just absolutely love your stuff. And this was another one. The characters are just amazing, and part of the thing, and, and we'll move on to some other stuff, but I just absolutely love Part of that story is that's so funny, it really rings true that in your in your late 20s, in your 30s, when you start hanging out with people, the friends that were always your friends get married or do different things and your lives start taking you. Mm -hmm. And that was a big point in there that I, I really liked that, yeah, it really is. You start hanging with people and doing things, and that's where these folks found themselves. But they were hanging with some people that they didn't, because they drank together on Thursdays, they didn't necessarily go to their homes, didn't necessarily know, but all of them from such different, one a bartender, one a doorman, mm -hmm. one lady just wor working, selling, well, a travel agent yeah, basically, travel agent. Mm -hmm. and then kind of a big to-do, uh, like, what was he, kind of a bond exactly. sales guy, exactly, like that, yeah. that type of guy. Trailer. And I really like that, that, yeah, it really is, you really capture how the, you know, life in the 30s, and the your last book of the 30s and 40s, I just think you're doing a magnificent job of really capturing, that's what I love. The books are great in and of themselves, but these characters, it seems like I know half these people <laughs> that I've, you know, that Thanks. I that I have drank with them, that I've known them, that I felt bad for them. So, congratulations! You're just doing a magnificent job on all your books. Thanks I, very I, much. I really that's really that. that's that means a lot to me because that's I was really trying to capture that that feeling, and I think it's something that most of us have found in our thirties. You still love these old best friends, but. Right. If you haven't seen them or spoken to them in two years, are they still your right. best friends? Right, are they still your best friend? Yeah, exactly. If it's, if it's just an email of baby pictures, can right. you call them your best friend? Or right. It's the people you're really hanging with and doing stuff. But uh, I heap this high praise on you, and I mean it, but obviously I'm not the only one. Moving on a little bit, every novel, the, the incredible success you've, you've had, I congratulate you for it. Every novel has been an option that you've come out with for, for a movie. Yeah, we've had really good luck with that. And you just yeah. jumped out. You're, you're a man that was in business. You're, you're in the business mm -hmm. world. And then you just decided to come out with your first book, uh, The Blade Itself, which we don't have a... Uh, and then the success has just been going from there. Now, The Blade Itself was optioned uh, the very first time we talked to you. Yeah, that was optioned by Ben Affleck and Matt Damon's production company. And, and so that's still out there as ha happens in Hollywood. But now your other novels have all been picked up. Could, could you have ever imagined this success? No, no. It really makes me, it, it, it's, it's a wonderful feeling, obviously. It makes me very happy. But it's really interesting, too, because I don't, I don't write them with the intention of them being turned into movies. I'm not trying to think 
oh, this is a good cinematic scene or this one would be great for a particular actor. I'm just writing the books that I want to write that feel mm -hmm. real to me. But I've been very, very fortunate on it. They've all been optioned, basically, and they're all at some level, some different level in development. And a couple of them are looking really good. Blade itself, they've got an approved draft of the screenplay. They've, uh, the studio's really excited about it. They've got some talent attached that I've been sworn, uh, I, uh, I've been sworn to secrecy on. But that one's looking really good, and good people. Uh, there's a second draft of the script in the works on that. That was optioned by Tobey Maguire. Right, and the the guy who's adapting that it wrote a screenplay called Before the Devil Knows You're Dead. Oh, that's amazing! Uh, yeah, amazing movie. movie. Sure. Yeah. So oh, I, really, I didn't know that. I can't wait to read his version. It's really interesting to read someone else's version of your work. Well, I'm really interested in that, and that's something I wanted to ask you about. That the feelings I'd like you to talk a little bit about the feelings you have when you've created a piece of work. And then you let it go. Of course, at first, it's got to be an amazing amount of excitement that, wow, somebody likes my work enough to uh, pay to you know, try to make it into a movie. But then is there a little apprehension at, okay, this is my vision, at letting somebody else then uh, nitpick at that vision and, and make changes? There's a little, but you learn to let it go pretty quickly. It's, um, my, my book is still there. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's right there. Mm -hmm. And I, I did everything I could to say what I wanted to say in that. So this is somebody else's vision of it, and they're very different media, uh, and they're just, there are things that you need to do differently, and you get a l much larger group of people involved also. I mean, on a movie, even just at the very high level, you've got the screenwriter and the stars who have a big impact, and the director and the producers and the studio all weighing in, and it just, it, it, it has to, you have to understand that it's gonna change. But it actually, it turns out to be a really interesting experience. I've read two drafts of the script for Blade itself. They've just been generous enough to share them with mm -hmm. me. And the story changed. Each one was different, a different vision than I had had in mind initially for my novel, but they were both great. Mm -hmm. And so in a way, it's kind of funny because there's my novel, which I love, and then there's this movie, which would be great, and this other movie, which would also be great. And I'm sure what'll, if something gets made, it'll be a fourth or fifth version. But. Now, as you're getting this education into the film business, because I, I certainly didn't know, I thought, okay, well, it's optioned. Because when we first met here, two years back, mm -hmm. I, I, I thought, well, maybe even three years now. Okay, uh, two years. It's optioned, boom, it's just a fast, it's not a fast process. No, and it's not a guaranteed process at right. all. And uh -huh. tell us a little bit about that, that when something is optioned, it means that they absolutely love it and all that, but, but then directors are, so this one is at a level, that the blade itself is, is at a level where directors have been chosen and it's at that level? Uh, it's at a level where they're looking for the right director. Oh, okay. Uh, the way that it works, yeah, optioning a film means that they would like to make it and they want the exclusive option to be able to make it. Mm -hmm. So they're basically taking it off the table. And from there, they usually start with screenplay, so they find the right screenwriter to do it, drafts back and forth. And that process, I've been very fortunate. It's gone fairly swiftly for me compared to some others. Mm -hmm. But it can go, it can last years. And, it, and nothing can happen at the end. They cannot mm -hmm. like the screenplay that comes in or the production company can just change or the, the tastes of the public can change and they decide it doesn't work. But if they get a screenplay that they like and that the studio likes, then they usually start looking for ca either cast or directors. Because one of the things that I've learned about filmmaking that I didn't know is that it's really, it's, um, it's either a name director or a star that gets a movie made. Mm -hmm. Basically, okay. once they have one of those attached, the studios get very interested. So it's... De Niro is on this movie. Then he's boom, not it's going. But yeah, right, but it's okay. It's like De Niro wants to do it. We want to do it. And that's and how everything else. That's falls how the in wheels get it. rolling. Exactly. Now, let me ask you: When you first did the Blade itself, and then immediately uh, you had the success, and then it was optioned. Mm -hmm. You're a much different person now. This many novels later, and the continued success. Do you see yourself in a year, five years from now, maybe wanting to be attached to a film in a little more? Uh, professional way where maybe you would like to do your own uh, screenplay adaption of a novel? Do you ever see that down the road? You know, it's interesting. I've started to play with the form just because I like to try new things. And so I, I've been working on a screenplay on the side that's a totally separate thing. Okay, it's not that an adaptation of one of my novels. But um, there's a, there are s a role that is sometimes played by a novelist where they come in and do a, a second pass mm -hmm. on a script that somebody's already done or where they work with a screenwriter. Right. I think something like that would be great. I would love to build to that. But to be honest, to adapt your own work whole cloth scares me. It's just, uh, it's four, it's three, four hundred pages and it needs to turn down to 110 in an entirely different medium and I'm too close to it. You know, I just, I don't know that I'd be the right guy to 
take a novel and try and from a blank page write wow. the movie of it. That's really interesting. So you have decided to try to do a screenplay on your own. Mm -hmm. oh, that's something you like to do. Do you want to tell anybody what that? What would you like to I, speak about yeah, that? Yeah, I can or, talk a little about it. It's uh, it's not anywhere near near ready. It's actually something I'm writing with my friend Sean Shirkover, who's okay. a spectacular crime novelist. You've Previous guest, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and uh, one of my best friends, and so he and I decided we'd like to do something together, but a novel is just not something we felt we could write together, and a screenplay sounded like fun. So we actually we took a month this last winter and locked ourselves in a cabin and just started working on a script. And we, we got a first draft done that is a solid first draft, but nowhere ready to... To show to people so well that's something we'll definitely be uh, on the lookout for Thank now you. i know that you and sean uh a perfect time to mention you've got a wonderful blog that you work with uh friends from chicago the mm -hmm. chicago area different authors and stuff a real interesting blog why don't you tell folks at home a little bit about that sure it's called the outfit collective it's at the outfit com, and it's a blog of 10 chicago area writers all crime novelists and we blog every weekday about writing, but also just about fiction, about Chicago, about crime. It's sort of a running discussion. Mm -hmm. We'll respond to each other's things. There are a lot of comments from readers, and we love to go back and forth from there. So it's basically just a, a, it's a, a group discussion with some really interesting people, from best-selling novelists and, and icons in the genre like Sarah Paretsky, mm -hmm. to one of our new additions is a guy named David Ellis, uh, who's been who's a, an Edgar Award-winning novelist in his own right, but is also has been working on uh, prosecution for the Blagojevich case in Chicago mm -hmm. and is is really involved in, in legal affairs there. And so it's topically, we're all over the map, but it's always interesting. Yeah, it's a really incredible blog, folks. And uh, when you go to our website, it's linked on both Marcus's uh, website and then their blog is also linked on because it's just an incredible incredible read uh, i recommend going there at least a couple times a week because there's just incredible e either news topical stuff or just people talking about the books and congrats to each other and uh you and sean have had so much success lately there there's a lot going on with that uh, sean's had an incredible amount of success you're now having an incredible amount of success and Thanks. everybody on there is really quite so it's it's kind of a meeting of the minds on there and then just watching some of the people commenting mm -hmm. you've gotten some incredible people commenting. Like, wow oh so this person reads it that person reads that's it. my it's favorite part is is watching it watching the discussion because we people put things out and because we don't limit ourselves topically you'll get you'll get a tremendous writer um talking about writing tips on how they put their novel together mm -hmm. deep in-depth stuff and then the next day you'll get something about national politics or we'll get a post on racism and how we get over it. And watching the discussion that forms around that is always my favorite part. All right, and now at your website, there's some, uh, there's a link on yours, just some of your favorite things you've written on that blog over, mm -hmm. I think that, I really recommend that. And then also some of the writing tips for aspiring writers, there's some free stuff on that website, some free thoughts from different writers about how they how they do their job, and mm -hmm. it's really priceless stuff Thanks, for free. Jim. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, it's, it's all stuff that I've compiled. That's, um, it's, it's articles that I've written, basically, mm -hmm. and tips that I've learned in doing this. So many people helped me when I was writing my first novel and before I'd sold it, when I was trying to find an agent, that I just felt like it's, it's kind of our role to give some of that back. And so I have everything from a really hands dirty description of how to find an agent uh, to more just sort of bullet pointed writing tips that are things that I learn right. that I add to as I as I write new books I mean I've added probably 10 tips to that as I've written these books because I've just learned something well I hi highly recommend for you folks at home if you're interested you want some writing tips you're an aspiring writer go to his website because there, there is a lot of great stuff on there and the outfit blog also is uh, just in incredible places so make sure you make that a stop uh, wanted to talk a little bit more about um, a, your work, we were talking off camera about the fact you've come out with about a book a year, which I just find an incredible, incredible pace. Um, do you want to continue that type of pace? What's, what's coming down the road? What can we expect? And short stories. Is there anything uh, new with you with short stories and things like that that you wanted to talk about? Uh, sure. Short stories. I have a short story in a new anthology called, uh, uh, it's, it's by a group called Thuglet, which runs <laughs> a great website. And the book mm -hmm. is called Sex, Thugs, and Rock and Roll. And <clears throat> the writers in it are really some of the some of the finest noirists working today, uh, and they were gracious enough to give me a slot in it. Mm -hmm. And this, the short story that I wrote for that, sometimes I find short stories very tricky, and sometimes they come together be better than others. And that one is one that I just am really happy with. That I think just 
you're always, when you're writing, there's, it's sort of like there's a target and you're throwing darts at it and you never actually hit that, but you get closer and closer to the center ring sometimes. And this was one where I just was really pleased with it. So that's, that's one of my favorite short stories. Uh, as far as the novels, Book a Year is, is sort of, um, it's a good pace assuming things go well. Mm -hmm. And so far I've been able to, to keep that up doing about a book a year. And I'm on contract for two more in the next two, more? two years. Okay. So hopefully I'll be able to maintain it. Well, that's fantastic if you can, because we absolutely lo I, I love it at the pace that sometimes you have to wait too long. And it's, oh, no, I need another book. So I'm, I'm glad the pace you've been, uh, you've been setting, and we certainly enjoy it. Uh, go going back to the uh, short stories, do you see yourself ever publishing a short story collection, or does that not necessarily interest you? Uh, I suppose maybe when I have enough that I think are worthwhile, and mm -hmm. if anyone's interested in publishing it. Short story collections are... are tricky projects. Mm -hmm. They just don't tend to sell very well. And so it's not something I put front and center, but over the last three, four years, I've had, I think about half a dozen, six or eight short stories that are, that got published and that I'm pretty pleased with. And right. so maybe if that pace continues in 10 years, I'll what, have uh, enough. Uh, how many do you think you need for a nice short story? Like about 15? Maybe? I would guess. Yeah. 15, around, 16? around 15, something like well, that. Well, I would certainly have, I've read a couple of your short stories and really enjoyed the heck out of them. And I like the short story as a form. I always have. I do too. And I do too. I was privileged last year. I was an Edgar judge for the best short story. Mm -hmm. And, uh, it was really interesting to read. We read something like 500 short stories, submitted short stories. And it was fascinating to read them and kind of see the trends and see what worked and didn't. And I like getting some of these collections and then learning about authors that you may not have, mm -hmm. you know, it might be somebody finds out about you through this collection you're in now, or, you know, That's Sean Sherkover or somebody like that, that you, magnificent work and they're writing, you know, you're writing magn magnificent stuff in a short story form, but great novels. I've found a lot of, uh, authors that way. Just, Thank you. hey, I, I really like short story and then go on. I bet a lot of people are finding you that way. I hope so. That's actually the other short story anthology I have out this summer uh, is Thriller 2, which is mm -hmm. the follow-up to this, the huge book, Thriller right. yep, 1. <laughs> uh, and it's edited by Clive Cussler, which is kind of a cool thing. Just a guy and I read a lot of books of his when I was younger. With the unfortunate passing of Michael Jackson, you'll probably get five million blog er, uh, hits on, on that book alone, just saying Thriller too. I about <laughs> that. I like that. <laughs> you might, uh, they might final, sell more than uh, uh, the best-selling uh, collection of all time now. Um, I'm actually looking forward to picking that up with, uh, isn't Morell, David Morell, and a whole... Uh, a, a huge lot. selection of authors from the International Thriller Writers yeah. Organization donated a yeah. story to help su support the organization. Well, okay, so uh, that's coming out later? That is actually, that came out, I think, about a month ago. Oh, okay, uh, it is out. Yeah, it just came out in okay. hardcover, and uh, it's a great collection. There's some terrific stuff in there. Okay, well, fantastic. Well, we've got a couple minutes left. Uh, we always like to tell the folks at home about your website and all that, so we'll do that before it's over. But is there anything you want to get off your chest or say to the folks at home? <laughs> or uh, they, Have we covered everything we wanted to cover here today? I, I, th I just, I mean, I want to thank you for having me so much. I, uh, I very much appreciate it. Uh, I guess I should mention that Good People came out in paperback mm -hmm. about a week ago. So if you didn't get a chance to pick it up in hardcover, if you want to try one of my books without uh, committing to a hardcover, for which I don't blame you, try Good People in paperback. Um, yeah. And yes. all, all of your past books all of my uh, previous books are, in are still in print well. and, mm -hmm. and in print and in paperback. And, uh, well, I thank you for coming on. I really sincerely mean it. Uh, part of the job here is to make an author f feel good. But with this show, I have authors on that I want to have on, or I have people on that I want to have on, not the other, you know. It's, it's about people that I really enjoy. And your books are just amazing, and I've said it before. I'll say it again. You are a guy, if, if I wasn't going to see you for a tour, you weren't going to come on, I'm going to read the book. I absolutely love it, and I pass it on. And each one of mine that I get gets read four or five times. <laughs> and I think I think you're one of those guys that says two million sold. You probably got ten million people read the book because yeah. I think it's your your word of mouth sales and and the good hey here's a real good guy you know here's the next Elmore Leonard or he's the next this or he's a you're the you're the Marcus Aiki. that's the important thing you're the you're, if you're only really I could get my wife stuff. to agree with that that's <laughs> but uh, okay well again I I thank you for always yeah, coming thank on. you Jim it's really it's a pleasure but uh, remind the folks at home your website. And the outfit blog, let them know about that. Yeah, we'll please. My, uh, my website is at MarcusSakey, S-A-K-E-Y, dot com. And I've got everything from excerpts of my work to tips for aspiring writers, contests, and links there to the outfit blog as well. Uh, if you're interested more in the outfit, that's at theoutfitcollective.com. Okay, Marcus, again, thanks so much, Jim, buddy. Thanks so much. I really appreciate, I appreciate you coming it. on. Thanks it means for having a lot me. to me. That was Marcus Seiki. He said it all. Go to his website, and folks, you know as always, if you didn't have a chance to write it down or anything like that, just go to our website, www.cult-pop.com. 
All of our guests are on the website. You can rewatch the episode or just go directly to their websites linked right up at our website. So we appreciate you watching both on uh, cable and at the website. We thank you so much for watching today and we look forward to seeing you next time. You were smart to come in right away. I almost didn't come in. Just imagine if I'd waited. Getting questions. Steve, are you okay? My hand just went numb, but I'll be okay. Let's keep going. It could be a stroke. You need to get to the hospital now. It's fine now, really. Oh no, Steve, you need to get to the hospital. If it's nothing, I'll buy you lunch. Earlier today, Steve had a transient ischemic attack, or TIA. TIAs are mini-strokes, often leading to a stroke at a later time. There is a simple stroke and TIA test called FAST. Face, does your face droop? Arm, does your raised arm drift downward? Speech, is your speech slurred? Time, if anyone exhibits these symptoms, don't waste time. Taking fast action can mean a second chance at life. Don't let a TIA get the best of you. Call 911 or get to the nearest hospital fast. For more information, contact National Stroke Association, 1-800-STROKES.